there. How are you doing? How's this going? Is this the last day? No. no. Okay, but we're close to cocktails, right? <laughs> um, I'm here to talk to you about storytelling and a little bit about marketing. Initially, I thought about calling my, my presentation storytelling, but then I really realized that it's uh, about marketing, the kind of work that we're doing. Um, when you get a little older, what happens is people start giving you awards for no reason. And last year, um, there's a coalition of camera manufacturers, they're called the Imaging Alliance, and every year they select one or two photographers, and they honor them for the contributions that they make, for giving back. And so I was chosen as one of those photographers, and they asked me to come to New York and talk a little bit about my work. And so I started looking in my archives and looking at my images and thinking, about images that I've made that actually have, have had an impact. And I realized that some of the most important images in my career are the ones that I actually never took. You see, many years ago, when I was a young photographer, um, I was sent on my first assignment to a remote village in the Amazon. To get to this place, you have to get on an airplane in Miami, and then you, follow, you fly to Sao Paulo, you then go to Manaus, to Marabá. The names get more, get more exotic, you know, the airplanes get smaller. Finally, you get into a Cessna and you fly three hours north over unbroken rainforest and you land in an airstrip in this village called Kenjam. The reason that I was there um, was to create a portrait of the people and the, what was going to happen to them as a mega dam was about to be built. And so they had asked me to go down there and create, you know, just a semblance of what, what was happening there, who were these people, and what was the situation. So, this dam was not an ordinary dam. The Belo Monte Dam was going to be the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world. And it was going to be built right here on the big bend of the Shingu River. Now, the Shingu River, you know, it meanders slowly through the landscape. It doesn't really have any rapids that generate electricity. So in order to create electricity, they were going to build three enormous reservoirs, as big as the city of New Orleans. Below the wall, um, the river was going to trickle almost to, to a halt, because in the Amazon you have two distinct seasons, the wet season and the dry season. And when it stops raining, the rivers run dry. So about 25,000 indigenous people that were living on the margins of this river were going to become isolated. In the Amazon, you only have a couple of choices to move around. There's no big highways. So if you want to go somewhere, you can either get on a small airplane or you can paddle on the river. So this, this was going to have a huge impact on these communities. My job was to show that the people that lived in these villages were completely self-sufficient. They needed so little from the outside world. You know, the river, the forest provide everything they need, and they're so incredibly proud. So when the dam was built, and they really didn't understand what was coming, they, they knew that there was a dam, but they had no way of visualizing what this was going to look like. Um, they were going to be uprooted from their villages and moved into cities where they were going to become the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable people. On the first night that I arrived there, I was exhausted after all that travel. They assigned me to live with one of the families, and they asked me to stay in, in this little, little house. They gave me a hammock, and I was just so tired that I wrapped myself in my blanket and went to bed. And sometime around midnight, you know when you wake up and you, you hear that somebody's around you, but it's so dark and you don't know where you are? Well, I felt people touching me, and they were talking. And it was not until later that I was told that the family was so concerned that I didn't have my children or my husband with me, and I was going to wake up in the middle of the night and feel lonely. So they were keeping me company. And I'd always wanted to see one of these little birds. It's a pygmy owl. They're uh, nocturnal. That's the adult size. They live high up in the canopy, so you never get to see them. And when I woke up in the morning, here it was. I started going around the village and looking at the other houses and realizing that every house had a different kind of pet. Most of the houses had some kind of parrot or macaw. They pluck the feathers, they, they trim their, their, wing fly, their, their flight wings, and then they cannot fly away. And the parrots and the macaws end up living underneath the houses with the dogs. <laughs> it's really cute. And of course, they need the feathers to make these beautiful headdresses for all their ceremonial activities. Um, I ask children when I lecture, you know, you guys know what this animal is? 
Oh, it's a baby capybara. So cute. And it's interesting in the Amazon because the lines between pet and food are really blurry. <laughs> Um, I was also fascinated by the art of body painting, which is really beautiful. These are not permanent tattoos. They, they make an ink out of a forest fruit called the Jenny Pop. They break it all open and then they mix it with charcoal. And the substance uh, that they create is, creates beautiful ink. And so you see children that are four or five years old. They sit around for an hour or two while their mom or their auntie or their sister paints these beautiful designs on their body. And then it washes away about a, maybe a week seven days, 10 days, and then they start all over again. It's a very, very important part of the social bonding of this community. And the painting can tell you a lot about who a person is. You can tell if somebody's single or married. It's really great marketing. <laughs> you can tell if somebody belongs to a household or if somebody is mourning or recently wed. And the boys tend to get more of the animal designs. You know, you, they'll get the jaguar spots or they'll be all black like monkeys. Whereas the girls tend to get more of the weaving, basketry, hammocks. And the girls also like to pluck their eyebrows completely and they shave the top of their head. And so when you arrive in the village, the first thing that they want to do is they want to make you beautiful like them. <laughs> and so they paint you and they, you really have to establish boundaries fairly quickly <laughs> because it's kind of difficult to explain back at the Miami customs, you know, what the hell's going on <laughs> when you go back a week later. So I was there, you know, starting to make my pictures when one afternoon I saw a group of women coming up from the river. And this was not, not unusual because these are very clean people. So they go down to the river every day and they bathe. And then at night they go back again. So as these women came closer to me, I realized that they had a brand new baby. And I thought, oh, wow, they just took it down to the river for its first bath. You know, that ceremonial ritual bath that creates a permanent bond between that baby and the river. And I totally missed it. So I was starting to feel, you know, sad about myself. I thought, you know, maybe in the morning I'll go and find the mother and ask her if she can bring the baby back and bathe it again. But when we woke up in the morning, we learned that the baby had not survived the night. Because as it happens in many third world countries, you know, there's high infant mortality. And by the time I realized what was happening, they had already buried the baby, and I missed that too. And I was starting to think, you know, they're going to fire me. My editors, you know, I wish they'd send somebody that had a little more experience, that knew what they were doing. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody coming towards me. And when I looked, I realized it was the mother of the baby, and she was coming straight at me. And so I'm standing there alone with my camera, and nobody's going near this woman. And as she got closer, I realized she was carrying something. In her sorrow, this woman had gone, and she had dug out the body of her baby, and she was carrying it around. And she was sobbing, and she had a machete in her hand. And with the blunt edge, she was hitting her forehead and crying. She was coming straight at me, covered in blood, covered in mud. And I just stood there, paralyzed, not knowing what to do. And I didn't take a single photo. So a few months later, we learned that the dam had been approved and construction was to begin immediately. And I realized that maybe if I'd had the courage to take some images, they would have made the newspaper or, I don't know, they could have changed the conversation but I'll never know because I didn't do my job. So from that day on, I decided to have the courage to stand up for the things that I believe, and this is why I'm here. The good news is that I got to go back to these villages many times and spend time with people that are truly amazing. Not only are they self-sufficient and very capable, they're also kind and generous, and they have a wicked sense of humor. They really are a lot of fun. And for people that live in remote places around the world, like these Kayapo villages, sustainability is not just a marketing word. They really, truly live a very sustainable life. So the way I got here is because in university, I wanted to you know, be part of a solution to feed the world. And back in the 80s, we thought that the ocean was going to be that solution. So I went to study fisheries. And what I learned in school was just how devastating it is the, the way that we industrially exploit the ocean. So when I graduated, I decided I wanted to do something else. I went to work for conservation. And first, I worked as a scientist writing scientific papers. So you can spend months, you know, even a year, writing a paper. And then you realize that nobody reads that stuff. 
really. <laughs> so I moved on to the Visual Communications Department of Conservation International, and that's how I became a photographer and eventually found my way to a little known magazine known National Geographic, <laughs> where I now have a big audience that listens to my stories. But even National Geographic is frustrating because I, I know that you are aware of the purchase of 21st Century Fox. You know, they put a huge endowment of $700 million for the society to do the charitable work that they need to do. You spend a year taking these pictures in the middle of nowhere, getting bitten by mosquitoes. You come back with your photos, and then maybe six months, a year later, your pictures will be published. And then there they are, you know, 12 beautiful images in the magazine one month and gone the next. I really wanted to do something more. So along with my partner, who's another National Geographic photographer, and another few people from, from the society, we created a little nonprofit. And I'd like to share with you a little bit of what we do. The ocean is like a kaleidoscope. It's always moving with color and gesture and light. And it's never the same twice. It's always different. It has the highest biodensity of life on Earth, way more than any terrestrial habitat. There is an entire new, dark, complicated world. And this world is the engine of our planet. Our own existence depends on a healthy ocean. Every other breath that a human being takes comes from the sea. Without the ocean, our planet wouldn't survive. It wouldn't function. It wouldn't run. When I began, I just wanted to make pretty pictures, you know, beautiful images. But um, along the way, there was somewhat of an evolution. I began to see a lot of problems occurring in the world's oceans, things that may not have been evident to most people. For most people, the experience of the ocean is from the beach, where it looks beautiful and it looks perfect. But there's a thin blue line that separates what we perceive and what we see from what the reality is. Once you go below this very thin molecular curtain of the surface, everything changes. You see a very different story. In the last 50 or 60 years, we've lost 90% of the big fish in the ocean, the, the sharks, the tuna, the billfish. For every swordfish pulled out of the North Atlantic, 10 to 12 blue sharks come with it. Day after day, week after week, year after year. We've lost half the coral reefs in this planet. You know, think about that. Half the coral reefs are gone. We have lost most of the ice in the Arctic. We've lost most of the ice shelves in Antarctica. And when you see all this life and how it is connected to ice, you realize that we will lose all levels of this ecosystem. As a photojournalist, I sort of felt a sense of, of responsibility and a sense of urgency to begin turning my lens towards those things. I wanted it to be more like war photography, to help tell a better story about what was happening in our, in our world's oceans. The biggest threat to our oceans right now is apathy. If we're ever gonna change people's behaviors, if we're ever gonna be able to change people's perceptions, that's only gonna start with an emotional connection, and that's gonna happen through photography. The idea to use photography to rally for conservation is not a new idea. It was born in the 1800s when photographers went out to Yellowstone and brought back images to Washington, D.C., and that gave birth to the first national parks. Photography has that kind of power. Images coming from the ocean are barely, barely 70 years old, and yet it's most of our planet. 15% of the terrestrial portion of the planet has been protected. Less than 2% of the ocean has the same level of protections. You have to have these replenishment zones. The ocean can heal itself with protection. It has this amazing resilience that it can come back. If we just do that little bit, you know, give it a little protection, it's an investment in everybody's future. All of these pictures have more power than scientists or voices or anything else to open the world's eyes to the sea. Vision is what drives humans. Through the internet, through television, through National Geographic magazine, we truly can reach the world to start driving this global debate on the effects we're having on this planet. It's the power of this visual communication that's at the core of Sea Legacy. 
We want to send photographers out there to the farthest reaches of the oceans where the story is being told. And we want to bring back stories of hope and messages for how this can be done. We still have 50% of the coral reefs. We still have 10% of the sharks left. It's not good, but it's not over. If I could do anything, I, I would hope that the work that we create will compel people to do something about this. We have a small window of opportunity to act, and the solutions are simple. We know what we need to do. We need to show everybody what's at stake. We need to rally soldiers of support. We just need the visual assets to do it. The hope is that our images, that the storytelling can help ignite. To convince the unconvinced. It's the first step in the process of change. So, you know, as we're making um, enormous leaps in the sustainability, uh, uh, the, the things that you guys are doing, they're amazing. We cannot forget about the other part of the equation, the wildlife, the conservation, the protected areas. And so I've been um, thinking a lot about that, you know, and the way that uh, the, the work that you guys do is funded by huge budgets that corporations are investing into cleaning up their the supply chain and, you know, reducing their carbon footprint, and it is all amazing. For those of us who live in mosquito-infested jungles, the work is funded in a very different way, and I've been thinking a lot about it. Most conservation organizations are funded through charitable contributions. The United States is by far the most charitable country in the world. Contributions from all sources amount to about $290 billion a year. But if we look at where the money is going, you start realizing that uh, religion takes the biggest chunk, followed by education, health, arts, and somewhere in here there's money for um, international affairs, refugees, homelessness, and the last little bit, you know, at the top of the mountain, environment, 3%. And this amounts to all the investment for all the animals in the world, the Humane Society, PETA, Conservation International. It's still a lot of money, but I wonder if it's enough. And when you look at the top of that little pyramid, 96% uh, of, the, of the money is invested in programs because we need to know uh, the science, the, the, pol the policy, to know what we're doing. The last little bit, the 4% is communications. 3% of that is used for fundraising and the message, you know, 1% of the budget dedicated to the environment. So, you know, I made this picture uh, last June and we posted it in the National Geographic feed. It became one of the most viewed videos ever in the history of National Geographic. It started going viral, you know, at first it's really exciting and then it gets really scary when you step into the dark web and the trolls come out. And I learned two very important things. One is that people are so unaware and uneducated about our planetary ecology. You know, people were asking, why didn't we feed this bear? You know, because they have no idea what polar bears eat. And they wanted to know why we didn't take them to the vet. But the scary part is, you know, the number, the immense number of people that are still denying that there's climate change. And to me, that's really scary. The good news is that we have an amazing platform in National Geographic, you know, we reach 80 million people every day with our, with our post. Within a few hours, this polar bear had 2 million views. It went on to get 2 billion views around the world. It, it is truly remarkable what we can do with communication. So for me, it's not a time to panic, it's a time to act. And you know, I, I speak a lot in public and I talk to a lot of audiences and I come to realize something. One of the biggest threats that we face is that people think that somebody else is fixing the environmental mess we're in. I made an acronym, I call it someone else is likely fixing it, eh? Because now I live in Canada. <laughs> to remind people, you know, that it doesn't matter how much work we do, if they're not invested with us, we're not gonna win. And so a huge part of the work that we do is just communicating to the public, you know, why does it matter that a polar bear is uh, starving in the Arctic? How is it going to affect and change their lives? Before I finish today, I want to tell you how the story in the Amazon ended. Because after six years of battling against these dams and keeping up the fight and empowering the indigenous communities, President Dilma Rousseff of Brazil was impeached. And the 60 dams that she had planned for every tributary in the Amazon were canceled. So advocacy work really matters and it really works. Thank you. So what I want to say to you is you guys are our last and best hope. <laughs> what you guys are doing is amazing. I feel like we're not going to get this done without you. And 
I have felt so inspired by what I've heard and what I've seen here, and I just wanted to say thank you for what you do, and let's carry on. Thank you so much. <laughs>